Well, thank you, boys. That was real, real fine. We're going to give you another chance to do some more playing. Right now, here is a brand new arrangement on a real old song, and it's from Bill Monroe's Rocky Road Blues. I woke up this morning, blues all around my bed. I woke up this morning, blues all around my bed. I didn't have nobody to hold my aching head. Well, the road looks rocky, but it won't be rocky long. Yeah, the road looks rocky, but it won't be rocky long. Cause some sweet mama done stole the mic and they're gone. Although she made close to 100 television appearances during her career, here's one of the only few video performances of her that survived today. But although many country stars from the 50s and 60s have faded into obscurity, Mimi Roman, for more than 60 years, has gently persisted in the hearts and minds of pure country, honky-tonk, and rockabilly fans around the world. But what makes Mimi different from those country stars from that golden age who now reside somewhere in anonymity? Well, it's best to start at the beginning. Rosalind Miriam Lapolito was born in the Bronx, New York in 1934. When she was 10, her mother remarried and her family moved across the bridge to Brooklyn. Her new father, Max Rothman, owned the successful Rothman Pickle Works as well as ran other successful ventures. Her mother, Estelle, had been a dancer with the Radio City Music Hall Rockettes. Except for faint memories of roller skating as a kid, Mimi's childhood revolved around horses. Mimi got her first horse that first year in Brooklyn, and with that, horses became her life. No English saddle riding for Mimi. Soon it was Western style only, and her weekends and summers were filled with countless riding competitions and horse shows. But we should probably back up here for a moment. To many, Brooklyn in the 1940s and the early 50s conjures up images of street vendors, Coney Island, and the kids playing stickball in the street. It might not seem like a probable place for serious horsemanship. But it was. Dozens of large stables and riding schools dotted the landscape around Brooklyn. Mimi won numerous riding championships and dozens of ribbons for her stock horses and her riding ability. Word got around, Mimi Rothman spent more waking hours on a horse than she did on the ground. Mimi became a true, full-fledged Brooklyn cowgirl. She attended high school just three days a week because the rest of her time was spent tending to her horses and getting ready to compete in shows. Mimi also became a top markswoman, an excellent shot with a rifle and won a number of shooting competitions. Mimi was a member of a tribe of area young people who shared a similar affection for horses and all things Western. They referred to their clan as the Brooklyn Cowboys and they took their Western attitude seriously and their Western style, sporting Levi's and Western shirts, cowboy boots, and cowboy hats. And most were huge fans of country music. Mimi at 16 loved all the popular music at the time. She wanted to be a lounge and cabaret singer. But an incident out at her stables in Brooklyn generated the spark that would etch country music onto her soul. Here's Mimi telling the story, and although she tells us she preferred reading Captain Marvel comics when she was a kid, we chose to cobble together a few pictures from another popular graphic novel from that time to illustrate this part of her story. Here's Mimi. 
they had a, a, a horse who broke a friend's leg because I, I told him guy don't do it and he jumped up behind me and my horse was very sensitive threw him off and then stepped on him um, and then I felt yeah I felt very guilty so here he is with a broken leg and I would go over and you know I bring him food and stuff like that he loved country music and he had all these you know Hank Williams records and He'd play this country music. And I just, you know, started really to to start to really love the music. And then I would I would put you know at night on Friday nights I would listen to WWBA. I'd put the covers over my head and listen to the radio to uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. You know, whatever I could get on the radio. And there wasn't much country music in Brooklyn. But it, it just, I just struck a chord, you know, in, in me. When you're out on a horse and there's something about the rhythm of the, of the, of the horse walking and the songs, they, you know, you could sing along with the, with the pace of the horse. Mimi loved to sing. And now with her newfound love for country music, she vowed to learn to play the guitar and sing country songs, but she never imagined she'd be doing it professionally. I taught myself it was like three chords or something. So all you needed to the Hank Williams songs was three chords. That was the beginning of my career, really. It was, he was very influential in, uh, in my country music experience, and, and I don't think he ever knew. Later, 18-year-old Mimi was crowned queen of the Madison Square Garden Rodeo, chosen from 23 finalists. Each year, the queen was selected based on looks, personality, and riding ability. Back then, the Madison Square Garden Rodeo was one of the largest rodeos in the country, and the garden was, and arguably still is, America's premier sports and entertainment showplace. As rodeo queen, Mimi received a contract to perform with country music, radio, and movie star Gene Autry each night of the rodeo's month-long run. One of the things I did was he had, he'd come out on his horse, Champion, and then he had a little, a horse called Little Champ, which looked like a, it looked like a baby, but it was a full-grown horse, but it was small and nasty little guy. And he would, you know, bite, he'd try to bite me the whole time, you know, and I'd, I'd run out with the Little Champ. This was the third time Mimi had competed in the contest. She'd gotten word that one of the top rodeo officials was anti-Semitic. So this time, she dropped the T from her last name on her entry form figuring Roman sounded less Jewish. When I, when I became rodeo queen, now that was, you know, my first, my first job and my first experience with, you know, people that were not from New York. And I remember a guy coming over me and saying, you Jew? And I said, yes, I am. And I, I took my hat off and I said, see, no horns. They, they really, they really did think we had horns. So I had to prove that there weren't any. Just five months after being crowned queen of the rodeo, Mimi was given an opportunity to audition for Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts. The highly popular program was nationally broadcast by CBS on both radio and television and was by far the most important talent contest at the time much like the show America's Got Talent is today. The show was hosted in what would one day be the Ed Sullivan Theater. Its format was simple. Viewers and listeners were asked to nominate acts, professional or amateur, who they thought deserving of exposure to a national audience. So my neighbor worked for the Godfrey Show. He was a cameraman. 
and he said, um, he said, I, 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 I think you should audition for the Arthur Godfrey Talent Scouts. And I said, oh, you know, don't be silly. And he said, no, he said, I think you, you, you might get on. So he made an appointment and I went down and I sang a pop song for them. And they said, do you have anything else? And I said, well, I can, I play the guitar and I can sing a country song. So I did, I don't know, a verse of something. And they said, okay, come back tonight and for the, and sing for the producer and bring your guitar. The song that I, I sang for them, I only knew the chorus. So I went down to the Colony Records store and I bought the record. And I, then I went home and practiced the song because I didn't know the whole song. And I came back that night and I sang for the producer and they said, okay, you'll be on next week. Getting on Talent Scouts was like finding a golden ticket. Back then, the show's high ratings made it the third most popular show on television, just behind I Love Lucy and Dragnet. Many contestants who appeared on the show became major stars, like Tony Bennett, Rosemary Clooney, Connie Francis, Leslie Uggams, Patsy Cline, and many others. Three acts were picked for each Monday night show. At the program's conclusion, the studio audience selected the winner by way of an applause meter. I went on the show with my little cowgirl outfit on. Very evident tonight that the winner is the little western singer from Brooklyn, Mimi Rose. And I won. Mimi performed on Arthur Godfrey's daytime show for the remainder of the week, performing for more than 11 million television viewers and millions of radio listeners. With her impressive singing and people learning on the show about her riding and shooting skills, Mimi was now being referred to as a modern day Annie Oakley. She began receiving offers for personal appearances. She got an agent. Things started moving even faster. A few weeks after appearing on Talent Scouts, Mimi was invited to appear as a featured guest on the popular Midwestern Hayride television show. This is the story of my life. Everything just happened. Do the Midwestern Hayride. And they come to me and they say, you know, the staff singer, girl singer is leaving. Would you be interested in the job? And I thought, okay, you know, why not? It's the Midwestern Hayride, live from the studios of WLW. The Midwestern Hayride was a weekly show simulcast on radio and television. And NBC TV broadcasted the show nationally during the summer. The program dominated the Saturday night television airwaves and was a staple of the station's programming during the golden era of television. WLWT's sister station, WLW Radio, put Mimi to work there, too. They gave me my own show every morning. The Willis Brothers were my backup band. That was pretty exciting, yeah. And it, it, at the end of the show, I would have to do a hymn. That was the way the show ran. And you can imagine how many hymns a Jewish girl from Brooklyn knew. Well, that was like learning on the spot. <laughs> That's not all. Around the time Mimi joined the Midwestern Hayride as staff singer, Paul Cohen, head of the country division of Decca Records, shown here with Decca recording artist Patsy Cline, signed Mimi to a multi-year recording contract. In addition to Patsy, Mimi was now featured on the same label as big country stars like Red Foley, Ernest Tubb, Webb Pierce, and Kitty Wells, and many more. With all these amazing opportunities coming at her so fast, it almost seems natural that the next big stage Mimi would be performing on would be inside Nashville's Ryman Auditorium. Mimi was now living in Cincinnati and working on the Midwestern Hayride television show when she flew to Nashville to make her debut at the Grand Ole Opry. 
He's just about the best friend I ever had. In Nashville, the day before the show, Mimi had her first recording session for Decca on the stage inside an empty Ryman Auditorium. Besides being known as the mother church of country music, the Ryman stage was often used by Decca's Owen Bradley and other Nashville record producers for studio recordings due to the venue's extraordinary acoustics. Top Nashville session musicians backed Mimi that afternoon. Chet Atkins on lead guitar, Jerry Bird on lap steel, Jack Shook on rhythm guitar, Ernie Newton on bass, Doug Kirkham on drums, and Owen Bradley on piano. Mimi says her first session with Decca went well, but she admits she was still a greenhorn when it came to the music business. I, I wrote thank you notes to all the musicians because I didn't realize they got paid. I thought they did it as a, fa as a favor to like Owen Bradley. That's how naive I was. So I wrote thank you for playing on my session, but it was so naive, oh my goodness. In those days, Grand Ole Opry shows were sold out a year in advance. Many folks would drive hundreds of miles to see the show. That night's show featured as headliners Ray Price, Hank Snow, and the Leuven Brothers. Mimi was scheduled to perform later in the show, and she waited with the other performers backstage. Then they gave her the word she was up next. She waited in the wings until the band left the stage. Then it was her turn. Mimi Roman. The snow falls around my window, but it can chill my heart. God knows that Walking on stage was really, um, it was thrilling. I, I realized how important it was. I had sung Weary Blues, that's what I sang on the Godfrey show, and it was going to be my first record. Oh, sweet daddy, please come home. After I came off, Ray Price comes up to me and he says, you know, Hank wrote that for me. And I was so intimidated, oh my God. He scared the hell out of me. And of course, I was a huge fan of Ray Price. I loved, you know, loved to sing. And I, I didn't know that, but wouldn't have made any difference. That was my record. I had to sing it. Forgive me if I cry. The one who was the warmest and the nicest to me was Minnie Pearl. She came, you know, she came over and, and just, you know, was was so kind and, and uh, sweet. You know, her the character she played on stage was nothing like the person she was. And then whenever she'd see me, you know, was always she always was was very gracious. She really made me feel comfortable. I just remember her so fondly. Mimi would be back playing the Opry many times down the road. After her successful debut. She headed back to Cincinnati in the Midwestern Hayride. Working on that show provided her the perfect place to further hone her performance skills and broaden her knowledge of the music and entertainment business. 
She left after about a year. She moved back to Brooklyn and began working country music package shows based out of Nashville and guest appearances on other country music television shows. Soon, Mimi's career and popularity were climbing to a whole new level. And now back to some more good music with Miss Mimi Roman. Instrumental time now. It's Dale Potter and all the gang in the Alabama Jubilee. Mimi was now playing shows with country music heavyweights including Ernest Tubb and Bill Monroe. She opened for Johnny Cash in Florida, and then later headed over to Meridian, Mississippi with Johnny and E.T. to perform for nearly 100,000 people at the annual Jimmy Rogers Day, along with Hank Snow, Roy Acuff, and Goldie Hill. She was playing Grand Ole Opry package shows with Gene Shepard, the Lubin Brothers, and Arkshaw Hawkins. Mimi was all over the place, including featured guest shots on the Louisiana Hayride and Ozark Jubilee television shows and the Jimmy Dean show. In Tennessee, the town of Maryville selected Mimi as queen of their annual Hillbilly Homecoming Festival. The homecoming king that year was singer Pat Boone. Tennessee Governor George Clement introduced Mimi on stage that first night. Hillbilly Homecoming was a week-long affair with top-name country music stars performing nightly. Gene Shepard, Chet Atkins, and Homer and Jethro were featured performers the year before. The festival opened with a parade, followed by tobacco spitting, snuff dipping, and hog calling contests all week. The local citizenry, many who would dress up for the occasion, would joke that anyone who ever donned shoes and left the state always came back for homecoming. As that year's homecoming queen and featured performer, Mimi had a say in the week's performance schedule, and this ended up making her a couple of new friends. There was a disc jockey in the area, and he called me up. He was coming over to interview me and, you know, to see the show. And he said, I have these two boys that are friends of mine. He said they sing, and that they'd like to come along, that if you could, you know, if if they could get up and do a number, he said, they'd be happy to just, if you just, you know, buy them lunch. So I said, uh, you know, sure. Mimi had the two put on the performance schedule and didn't think much else about it. So he he comes and he's got the Everly Brothers with him. And, uh, you know, they were so cute. And, of course, they got up and they did, you know, a couple of numbers. I introduced them. And they do their songs, and they come off the stage, and I'm, we're sitting around, you know, and, and somebody had, like, moon, was the first time I ever tasted moonshine. It was, oh, just awful. But anyhow, we're sitting around, and, you know, they're singing, and I'm singing. And I said, you know, what, what you guys really need is a girl singer. I said, maybe, would you, why don't you think about maybe we'd be a trio? And they said, well, you know, they'd been singing together all their lives, and now uh, they, they're just going to, you know, keep it as a duet. Can't say I didn't try. A year later, the Everly Brothers, Wake Up Little Susie, would be the number one song on Billboard's pop country and R&B charts. Although they never became a musical trio, the three stayed friends after that. When they came to New York, they would, you know, call me. and would. I was closer to Phil. Don was very quiet and, and very reserved, and Phil was kind of like a little goofy. So, you know, we could kind of be goofy together. In addition to the Everly Brothers, Mimi was quite popular with many other country artists when they came to New York. Anybody that came to New York, I was the first one they called because I was the only one they knew. <laughs> And so, you know, I would go and hang out with them or go have lunch or... This sometimes included country music royalty like June Carter. She lived in New York for a summer to study at the actor's studio more than a decade before she'd married Johnny Cash. We met her at the Opry and I became friends with her. And I was, of course, in awe of the Carter family, Mother Maybell and the Carters. June worked with Ilya Kazan for a summer in New York because he thought she could be a, a great actress. And she, I think she just didn't really want to do it. Mimi says her and June's times together that summer were fun, but mostly uneventful. We just went and had lunch, you know, and just kind of hung out, just sat around and talked about other people. 
She was pure country and a, just a wonderful gal. I want to do one of my very favorite songs written by Floyd Tillman, and I hope y'all remember it, Baby. Mimi and Elvis met at the 1955 Country Music Disc Jockey Convention in Nashville that November, where he was named Most Promising Male Country Star. The two exchanged phone numbers, and within a month, he was coming up to New York while negotiations were taking place with his new music publisher, Hill and Range. He came up quite a few times, and of course, when he came up, he would come up with Parker, and then Parker would be happy to get rid of him because he was, you know, doing whatever Parker wanted to do behind his back. Elvis was never involved in any of the business stuff, you know. Uh, he hadn't been on television yet. He hadn't done the, you know, the Ed Sullivan show, and he hadn't done the Tommy Dorsey show. So nobody really knew him in the New York area. That would change before the year was up. Although he did not care for New York, the city for a while at least provided Elvis shelter from the storm. He had that freedom, he could walk around. But down in the South, they he had a pretty good reputation or a pretty bad good reputation. Right. In addition to a reputation for corrupting America's youth with his music, Elvis also had a reputation for having a steady string of girlfriends. And by that March, the widely syndicated gossip columnist Walter Winchell reported a big romance between Elvis and Mimi. But Mimi says that wasn't true. We were just friends, and I was the only person he knew in New York that he could hang out with and understood the way he felt about it. He did not like the big city. You know, he and I would just hang out and, and just do, like, you know, crazy fun kid stuff. This often meant going to the movies after a quick meal usually Elvis' favorite, a hamburger and a soda. Mimi was glad Elvis had inexpensive tastes back then because she usually ended up picking up the tab. Pretty much every time, wherever we'd go, he, he would only have $100 bills, and nobody cashed $100 bills in those days. As he got bigger, he'd have some smaller money with him. He would, like, give me money for a taxi to go home which, uh, you know, was very nice. But what would happen was he would give me money for the taxi and my mother would come and pick me up. <laughs> and I keep it then. It was like 10 bucks. While at the movies together, Mimi says she and Elvis each adopted their own watching style. He would watch the movie and I would watch him. His profile was just stunning. I mean, it's like he was carved. Really beautiful. We saw Helen of Troy and... It had all these, you know, Roman beauties in there. And I'm looking at him, and he had the most beautiful profile of all. There was no, no romance there at all. He was like a kid brother or something. Although it was apparent they both enjoyed each other's company, Elvis and Mimi's friendship proved to be short-lived. He was going out for a movie, his first movie, and he had the script. So we went up to his room, which was at the Warwick Hotel, and we went over the script. Mimi says that was the last time she saw Elvis. That September, Elvis made his first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, which captured more than 60 million television viewers and was the most watched TV broadcast of the 1950s. Two months later, Elvis's first movie came out, and it was a blockbuster. By the end of 1956, everybody in New York as well as all America now knew Elvis Presley. That year Elvis became the biggest star on the planet. From that point on, despite all of his success, Elvis's fame began to isolate him from the real world and would become locked in a prison of celebrity. I felt badly when I, you know, when I saw what happened to him, but couldn't do anything about it. I, you know, I had his home number, and the next time I was in Memphis, I tried to call him, and they had changed the number.
A month after Elvis made his first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, Mimi was back on the road, hitting the club circuit. There weren't many large indoor venues for country music like there are today. Most all country artists played the club circuit, and this included the Flame Cafe and Nightclub in downtown Minneapolis. A woman named Artis Wells ran the Flame's front lounge. Wells was a former circus trapeze performer and a professional wrestler who led the lounge's all-girl house band, the Rhythm Ranch Gals. When artists and their band went on each night, the floor behind the bar automatically rose up to become the stage, and the gals played and danced throughout the night, their boots skimming the tops of liquor bottles. In back, the Flames' large main room was where the headlining acts were featured. Mimi played the Flame one night with Cowboy Copas and Texas Bill Strength. The crowd's highly positive response to her performance that night convinced the club to bring Mimi back a few weeks later to headline for four nights. The entertainment reporter for the Milwaukee Tribune played up Mimi's looks in an article announcing her upcoming shows, writing, Mimi Roman is a looker, a brunette looker. Further, she adds to her singing and guitar playing some gyrations which may be foreign to a cattle ranch, but are apparently acceptable in a nightclub. The reporter may have been exaggerating about the gyrations, but it's probably a sure bet that the patrons of the flame those nights had plenty to talk about afterward. After the bar gave last call, and after firing up what was most likely a sonic torch to Minneapolis Flame Cafe each of those nights, Mimi had an after-show ritual. There was a bowling alley nearby, and I'd go over and bowl till about 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, when you come out of the, when you're working, you're revved up. I would, I would have a lot of energy, so I'd just go bowl. I would be the only one in the bowling alley. It was a 24-hour bowling alley in those days. It was lonely, but it didn't bother me. I don't mind being alone. But having some alone time would soon prove to be a rare commodity. Mimi joined the newly formed Philip Morris Country Music Show and set out to play one-night shows throughout the country with an all-star troupe of traveling country music stars. The show was initially scheduled for a 13-week run in the South, but because of its huge success, it ended up running continually for almost a year and a half. The show's publicity people figured they could spin some ink by making it so Mimi was pulling a switch on the traditional success pattern leaving the big city to make a name as a country singer in the South. But in reality, Mimi had already made it as a country singer and was exactly where she should have been. Opry star Jimmy Dickens left that show to join the new traveling show. Show members Carl Smith, Goldie Hill, and Red Sovine had also recently left the Opry. Ace fiddler Dale Potter came on board and Carl Smith brought his longtime band, the Tune Smiths, which included Ace Steel guitarist and Mimi's new steady boyfriend, Johnny Seibert. Thank you, Johnny. Always had a thing for steel guitar players. Get on the bus and I'd say, okay, no Jew jokes, no Catholic jokes. Um, you know, I, I, I set that standard as soon as I got on the bus. At the beginning, the, the only other female was Goldie Hill, and she she and Carl traveled separately, so I was the only girl on the bus. But it was fine, because I had been hanging around with guys all my life, and it was, you know, just another bunch of guys. 
Later, singer and yodeler extraordinaire Shirley Cadell would join up. She would marry the show's MC, Biff Colley. She would later become Mrs. Willie Nelson. Oh, it was just a bus, and it was old to begin with. It looked like the kind they transport prisoners in. <laughs> no bathroom. Pull over to the side of the road, all the guys get out. And I just didn't drink. <laughs> I was constantly dehydrated. The show was conceived as a promotional vehicle for Philip Morris, but it also provided a further boost to country music's popularity in areas where big country music acts most never came. The audience, the people were so nice. There's nothing more loyal than country music fans. I mean, they're with you from the cradle to the grave. Although it proved to be a big success, the Philip Morris Show was originally organized as a defensive public relations move because its brands were being boycotted in parts of the South. It happened when it was reported that Philip Morris had made a monetary contribution to the National Urban League, a civil rights organization. Proponents to the boycott said the league was simply a front for the NAACP which they viewed as a radical organization. Philip Morris was being boycotted for giving financial support to an organization that actively opposed racial segregation. Our object was to desegregate. They decided they would send this country music package out as a goodwill tour. So Philip Morris paid for everything. So we played, you know, we played in ballparks and stadiums, wherever wherever we could, but we, didn't, we, wouldn't, we would not segregate our audience. This didn't cause problems too often, but Mimi remembers one night in New Birth, North Carolina when it did. This, that was a scary night. We were playing in a tobacco warehouse, which is these enormous buildings. Because they still had segregation, the only way we could do it is the audience had to stand. We drove the bus into the warehouse. That's how big these warehouses are. Uh, and the audience stood. We did, I think we did a little shorter show, probably an hour and a half instead of like two or two and a half. We got on the bus. Bus pulls out of the warehouse. And there's the Ku Klux Klan in cars driving back and forth in front of the warehouse. And then they follow the bus and they've got their hoods on, the whole thing. And, and we just headed for the state line. We had a police escort, and we had the Ku Klux Klan. The police were in front of us, the Ku Klux Klan was in back of us. And that was scary. And I thought, all they have to do is find out there's a Jew on the bus. We don't have a shot. But despite obstacles, the traveling show proved successful, and its performances were well attended with audiences very often numbering in the thousands. In January 1958, the All-Star Touring Show celebrated its first full year on the road, a marathon of one-night stands. Despite floods and inclement weather, the troupe never missed a scheduled date during its first year. At this point, the show had performed in more than 300 towns and cities in 20 states. The show finally wore out its original bus. Philip Morris replaced it with a new flexible Vistaliner motor coach. Did the new bus have a bathroom? That was a luxury we were not afforded. <laughs> Mimi and the rest of the show members worked six weeks on and one week off, then five weeks on and one week off. During her weeks off, Mimi would go to Nashville to record for DECA and perform on the Country Music Time show. I stayed at the Andrew Jackson Hotel, and I stayed in the same room, and I used to ask them to hold that room for me, because that was then it was kind of like home. It's real nice to be here at Country Music Time for the U.S. Air Force. Mimi made a number of appearances on Country Music Time. The show was a 15-minute program syndicated via transcription and served as a public service address supporting enlistment in the U.S. Air Force. The show was pre-recorded and sent out to thousands of radio stations. 
Not only did the program serve a worthwhile cause, it also provided an opportunity for well-known country music performers to further gain valuable radio exposure. We hope that you'll stop by your local U.S. Air Force recruiter and tell them that you liked it so we can come back real soon. Right now, it's Mimi Roman saying goodbye for all of us. That was a nice trip, but I'll tell you the truth, one gets a little weary. When like After that, spending months on a bus with a bunch of people from the South, Mimi developed quite a country accent of her own. It's not something I, th I think that consciously I was doing, but just, um, I guess it's, it's the effort to fit in or, or just uh, couldn't get away from it. I'm trapped on a bus with 18, 18 guys from Nashville and, and surrounding parts, and eventually just, you just automatically start to fit in. You know, you just pick up the, the the intonations and it becomes, you know, part of your speech pattern. It did keep from having to answer a lot of questions, I suppose. Mimi also often performed at the Opry while she was in Nashville. Apart from the tightly scripted first portion of the Opry program that was nationally broadcast, Mimi says the rest of the show was essentially organized chaos, but it worked. So I was in Nashville a lot, uh, and any time I was there, I would just show up at the Opry, and they slot me something, you know. It was very loose uh, the way they did it in those days, you know. I mean, you just walk backstage, and they just you know look at you and say, okay, you know, you're going on at eight fifteen or you know nine fifteen or something. There were no rehearsals. It was very casual. Uh, you'd just walk out and, you know, you'd tell the guys what you were going to do and you would just borrow somebody's band. Whoever the act was before you would stay and play for you. After the Opry, Mimi would often go with some of the others from the show to perform again at Ernest Tubbs Record Shop, where he hosted a live radio show, The Midnight Jamboree. After that, she sometimes continued on to meet others from the Opry at Skull's Rainbow Room located in Nashville's Printer's Alley. The Rainbow Room was run by David Chillman, an eccentric Nashville native who was called the mayor of Printer's Alley. He loved poodles and was often seen walking them down Printer's Alley on rhinestone leashes. Elvis Presley once sent him a poodle. He couldn't have been nicer. When the Jewish holiday would come, if I was down there with my, mo my mother, he'd call, and he'd say, do, do y'all want to go to shul? He always had little dogs, so, so when I knew him, he had chihuahuas. And then he would he would offer to, for me to take a chihuahua back to the hotel to keep me company. He would, he'd say, would you like to take one of my little dogs? Following her weeks off in Nashville, Mimi would head on back to the Philip Morris show and begin a new round of one-nighters. When the show was first announced, it was pegged as the largest individual package sale in country music history and that's when it was going to be a 13-week run, not 60 weeks. Mimi would re-up her contract with the show every 13 weeks. Finally, towards the end of the show's run, Mimi admits she had very little gas left in the tank. I say I don't love you, I'm glad that we're through, but deep down I had made up my mind that I was not going to quit. Under I was going to be on that show as long as that show ran. I was not a quitter. If it killed me, and it almost did. When Mimi finally moved back home, she admits it took a little getting used to. I did not unpack for six months. I had my suitcase at the foot of the bed, and my mother would say, why don't you know, put your stuff away? And I said, no, because I know where everything is. And I, I did not unpack for six months. I lived out of my suitcases at home, because that's what I'd been doing. But it wasn't long after that, Mimi decided to board another bus and join Pee Wee King's Golden West Cowboys as featured girl singer. They traveled by bus from Louisville to Chicago every weekend for King's Saturday night TV show, broadcast from the Chicago Opera House. During all the years Mimi performed on stage, 
she suffered from what would be a serious handicap for any performer, extreme nearsightedness, which only got worse over time. Performing was never my favorite thing because I was blind as a bat, couldn't see the audience, and I didn't wear contact lenses at the time. So my, my choice was either to wear glasses, which of course was impossible, or to just, you know, go out there. And I used to say, well, how far out is the microphone? <laughs> Halfway across the stage. So I did, you know, because I, I just take a running start to get to the microphone. Oh, God. Mimi continued performing with Pee Wee King and the Golden West Cowboys for about a year. After that, no more buses for Mimi, but she continued playing club shows. Her final recordings for Decca were made in 1958, but she continued to record, first with Capitol Records, then Warner Brothers and Cap. Mimi never had a charting hit, but as many have already noted, this wasn't for lack of trying or lack of significant talent. Working in her favor had been Decca's A-team of Nashville session musicians backing her up. Chet Atkins, Hank Garland, Buddy Emmons, Bobby Moore, and Grady Martin, to name a few. And the legendary Owen Bradley, a key founder of the Nashville Sound, helmed all of Mimi's recording sessions. Not working in her favor was the system. Decca record executives Fearing that her New York pedigree could turn away country music record buyers, came up with the story that the Bronx-born and Brooklyn-raised Mimi was from California and had been active in the rodeo circuit there before her family moved to New York when she was a teenager. Decca let Mimi pick the California city she was from. She picked Salinas because she liked the name. In the 1950s, women in country music struggled for legitimacy and this did not even factor in what part of the country they were from or what their religious affiliations were. The fact was, the concentration of success for female country singers back then was relegated to a very small number compared to men. Owen Bradley was famously quoted as saying, I am charged with a country singer who wants to go pop and a pop singer who wants to sing country, referring to Mimi and fellow DECA artist Patsy Cline. It's a wonderful industry anecdote, but the reality is Mimi Roman, to use rodeo parlance, came right out of the chute a country singer. They didn't, really didn't know what to do with me. They just kept recording me, but didn't really do a lot of work on the things that they recorded, which was kind of weird. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't know any better. Mimi wasn't singled out for neglect, however. The statement, my label didn't know what to do with me, is precisely the same comment made by another female country music artist during Mimi's time, Wanda Jackson, who had been referring to Capitol Records. Jackson had signed with Decca the same year as Mimi, but switched to Capitol two years later. For a while, Mimi and Wanda were on similar tracks and form-fitting fringe dresses, and the two played a number of the same clubs around the same time. I just thought she was fantastic. She was the original rockabilly singer. She was my idol. I admired everything she did. I loved the way she worked and, you know, what she wore. And, uh, and she, she and I are the only ones left, I think. By chance, Mimi and Wanda had the same DECA duet partner, Texas country singer and western swing artist Billy Gray, who had been Hank Thompson's and Ray Price's band leader, and for a time headed up his own western swing band, the Western Okies, signed to Decca. In 1955, Wanda Jackson's first single made it to number eight on the country charts, a duet co-written by Gray. Three years later, the Decca team put Gray and Mimi together in the studio. Both duets recorded that day receiving a grade A cash box bullseye review, its highest review rating. But despite this and many other positive reviews, neither side of the record made the charts. Mimi says that throughout her life and her career, a door would open and she would just walk through it. 
but occasionally the door of opportunity would swing the other way, such as during the week of the 1958 Country Music DJ's Convention in Nashville. That week, Decca scheduled studio time for Mimi and Patsy Cline and split the girl singer song assignments between the two. Mimi got the duets with Billy Gray. Patsy got the song Walking After Midnight. It had been a toss-up. Then there were also times when the door would open and Mimi chose not to walk through, such as when her manager called her to tell her Colonel Tom Parker wanted to sign her. And I said, no, absolutely not, because I had known Elvis and I knew Parker, and I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be cattle. When Parker took an artist, or if he took an artist, he controlled everything. And I, that just wasn't my style. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to have that. If I had gone with him, it probably would have I'd have had a different career, but I don't think I would have been happy. Mimi says there is maybe only one thing she would change if she were to do it all over again. I should have moved to Nashville and lived there because I, I was doing all my work and living at it and in New York, and that was, that was hard. You know, you had to be there, be part of the community, and uh, I, I never... I never did that. You know, I knew everybody and everybody knew me, um, but I didn't, I never really felt like I fit in, you know, because I didn't live there. Equally strong, a singer of fast, hard-driving numbers as she is country ballads, Mimi Roman is today considered one of the pioneers of rockabilly. I need a little loving, I need somebody to call. The era of rockabilly arguably began when Elvis signed with RCA Records in 1956, the same year Mimi was picking up his dinner tabs and staring at him at the movies. Many of Mimi's fast-driving Decca tracks can be found on rockabilly compilations released in the U.S. and abroad. In England, a rockabilly revival started in the early 1970s and it spread across Germany and much of Europe in the 1980s. Mimi and a lot of other 50s artists got a slew of new fans. In 1962, Mimi married songwriter, musician, and singer Paul Evans. She quit the road and they soon had their daughter, Eden. Mimi then began to concentrate her life on Eden and on her husband's career. At that time, she and her new husband were working for Associated Recording Studios on 7th Avenue in New York, a two-minute walk from the famous Brill Building, epicenter of the American music industry that dominated the pop charts in the early 1960s. Mimi was a staff singer for Associated, singing demos for songwriters including Burt Bacharach, Carole King, Kander and Ebb, and Neil Sedaka. A young Paul Simon worked at Associated Studios along with Mimi as well. I worked for every great writer of the 60s. If they were alive and writing, I sang for them, their demos. When songwriters wanted to approach a particular artist or Broadway producer with their new song, they had a professional demo recorded with session musicians so they could give the artist a high-quality sample. During her time at Associated, Mimi sang virtually all the female vocal demos for Screen Gems, the number one publisher of hip songs in the 60s. That was probably some of my favorite work. It was a little restrictive, though, because you couldn't interpret it. You really had to sing exactly what they wrote. I love you, Conrad. Oh, yes, I do. Mimi also sang demos for many Broadway musicals of that time, including Funny Girl, Bye Bye Birdie, Chicago, and The Fantastics. Sometimes a record label would decide to put out one of her demos on its own. As a result, Mimi had a number of teenage pop songs released in the early 1960s under the pseudonym Kitty Ford. Was the gift of a thief. Ooh, 
Evenings after closing time at Associated Recording Studios were highly creative times for Mimi. After hours, she and Evans and sometimes their musician friends would go in and record their own tracks. Some of Evans' original songs and other music they liked, country songs and traditional music. Unshackled from the bindings of her day job singing demos for others, Mimi was free those nights to record her own interpretations of songs she wanted to sing. Mimi had a number of careers when she left Associated Recording Studios after 10 years. She had her own radio show in Bridgeport, Connecticut, booked talent for a nightclub, and performed in the area with her own country band, and she sold real estate. Mimi Roman has lived in Connecticut for the past 51 years. Eden, her daughter with Paul Evans, lives with her. Mimi's granddaughter, Ashley Eve, lives in Austin, Texas, and works for a major game developer. I'm a big believer in fate. Since I believed in fate for whatever it threw at me, I kind of went in that direction. A door would open up and I would go through it. Oh, I just kept doing that all, all my life. A door would open and I would just go through it. That is how Mimi Roman at 88 tells us of her life and her time in country music. But it took talent and a strong, beautifully distinctive voice for those doors to open and to go far once on the other side. It also took guts and plenty of stamina for a 20-year-old Jewish cowgirl from Brooklyn in the 1950s to make her way to country music fame. Albeit, too briefly.
did sound fine to me, boys. Thank you very much. I'm telling you, my life has been nothing but a series of coincidences.